Um, so welcome to our round table on creatively capturing the patient voice and experience. And we've got um, so, uh, someone here who's no better to do it than um, Kerry Hughes uh, from Same Bit Different. So Kerry runs a not-for-profit organisation which is uses the arts for positive social change by working in partnership with organisations, communities and individuals to highlight inequalities and bring communities um, like ours closer together. Um, so we'll be showing you a shortened version of um, Kerry's film, um, A Journey of Hope, and then we'll be going straight into discussion about the film. Oh my God, she's my little light, you know, whenever it's happening. She's my little light in the tumult. This is, who is she? She's, she's a happy, energetic child. There's no more words, she's Maida. And on the 26th of May, it was the last day with that cry, it was the last day I felt like a mother. That day I became a researcher. That day I became everything else. I knew that I'm the only person who can try to help my daughter to find the answers and help her because I, I was in the point of the black hole. I didn't know where I am. I didn't know how we're supposed to proceed. I was just left on my own. Nothing confirmed, just a big question mark. It's like golden ticket. Eight years of being lonely, scared. Eight years of not knowing. Eight years of wondering what's gonna be tomorrow. At some stage I stopped thinking what's gonna be tomorrow because I was afraid to think. So that diagnose gave me a hope. Gave me a right to be a mom gave me this marginal of worrying about the little things, feeling like I'm forgetting for a short time periods, forgetting that I need to think about disease because I already knew what we've got. You feel like I remember feeling, you know, that feeling when your your legs, you can't feel your legs anymore, and you just think back and you feel like, sorry, your world is collapsing, um, and then you have lots and lots of questions that you want them to answer, and at the same time you don't want to hear the answers. Having the name of the syndrome and a very clear list of of, of symptoms of challenges has been huge for us. And to have the diagnosis two weeks after birth, while we didn't appreciate it at the time, we certainly do now. And even within Wolf Herschel, lots of families don't have that advantage. They have to wait considerably longer. Um, so we, now we are incredibly grateful to have that. It, it really does make the, the world of difference and will do for the rest of Julia's life. Yeah, I guess when we got the diagnosis, yeah, the, the, our journey, our journey began. 
And it began with understanding Iggy Moore. Um, it began with a lot of uh, appointments, <laughs> specialists. Um, our diaries became, are still full of uh, caring for Iggy's needs, which are com so complex and, you know, it's a guessing game, basically, on what, what he needs. So that journey of completely accepting and letting go that your life will never be normal with him, you know? And accepting that that's okay and that we're gonna be happy and that he's clearly happy. And I think, yeah, so I think it began the process of accepting what that means. He's the most outgoing person, friendliest person ever. And, uh, you know, if that's a result of his condition, then that's uh, an amazing part of it as well. Like, there's the downsides, uh, but uh, he has such a vibrant, bubbly personality and instantly makes friends with so many people that I think it's just the most amazing thing. being hosted by Find a Cure. I'm joined by Tom and Julia and Shirlene. Tom is one of the families that you'll have just seen in the Journey of Hope short film. And Shirlene Badger is the patient advocate for Illuma, Illumina sorry, in the EMA region. Thank you. Um, today, I thought that we could look at the patient voice and advocacy and the importance of taking a creative approach. With Same But Different, one of the things that we've been quite keen on from you know, the very outset is to focus our attention on patients and their voice and give them a platform so that they can actually reach a wider audience. And the reason behind that is that generally, you know, if you've got a rare disease, you tend to really understand the whole life. You know, you know what it's like to get the diagnosis, you know what it's like to go on that long journey. But if it's a world that you don't really inhabit, then, you know, it can be quite alien. And so we want to try and create films and, and images that reach out to that wider audience. Shirlene, we actually met, didn't we, at the Find a Cure conference last year. And it seems like such a long time ago. But we, we chatted then in the very early days about making the film that became Journey of Hope. Perhaps you can explain why it's important to you as an organisation, but as a person as well, to share patient stories. So thanks, Kerry. Yeah, we, we did meet at a Find a Cure event. And as you say, those, those um, in-life events feel um, like a world away. Um, in some ways, but but again, so incredibly important for allowing and facilitating conversation between different people. So, Kerry, I'd seen your work, um, for, well, I'd known of your work for a long time, and I, I loved the way that you presented um, the beauty and the rawness of families' experiences, and that in each image that I'd seen, there was 
there was a story you know it wasn't just an image it told us something and it took us into it in in a, a number of different ways and made made us ask questions so for me it was a great opportunity to meet you and i think um to then start talking where we had shared interests. So, you know, for me, I think working for Illumina, we're a company that's, you know, several steps away from the patient in many ways. We um, enable sequencing that therefore enables diagnosis. But for us, it's incredibly important to think about the impact of diagnosis and what that journey looks like and what that pathway should look like, you know, what's going to be best practice. So when Kerry and I met, I remember we discussed, oh, we talked about all the stories we'd heard, we, um, all the families that we've met, and, and we had this real connection in terms of thinking about, okay, we wanted to tell a different story around diagnosis. We wanted to talk about the work that diagnosis did, and part of that was because, you know, so for us, Illumina, we might be thinking about uh, these questions that constantly get thrown at us in terms of clinical utility. What is the clinical utility of genomic sequencing and, and providing diagnosis in the rare disease space? And one of the things that we knew is that a diagnosis has value in and of itself. Just knowing is a value. And there's so many different ways that that knowing contributes to um, well-being um, and and also maybe stops a whole lot of testing that has been occurring, a whole lot of kind of harm that has been occurring. And Kerry, you and I just completely connected over that, didn't we? We were, you know, we, I think we both had this really strong ethic and we were constantly, but, you know, but we can't, can't just do this and we can't just do that. And it was more about, okay, so how do we get to these raw, truthful, honest stories that um, will start to show a different, you know, not a glossy rare story, but a, a, a story about what diagnosis, the work diagnosis does in reality. So, yeah. Thank you. I mean, you talk about raw um, stories and, and I know that that's something that we've talked about together a lot. Um, perhaps for, you know, people working in different organizations, perhaps you can explain what we mean about the raw stories. I guess, it might be that Tom could talk about this a little bit, actually, because that's what I love about what Tom has to say. Um, I, I think often, actually, Tom, I'd really like you to talk about this because you talk about people who kind of further down the diagnosis pathway or further down, um, you know, and have established patient organisations and have a nicely crafted story about that process. And yet that, that actually there's a reality that, you know, getting a diagnosis is never good, you know, but actually it gives something. And, and what, what does it give? But can I let you speak to, speak to that one? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the great things of, of, of when in our sort of cycle of things we, we did the interview for, for Journey of Hope, I think was really crucial um julia i think was uh just coming up for two um i think we were just at a really pivotal moment where we were coming out of the initial trauma and and grief um and sort of lack of knowledge and sheer panic um and we're entering a new phase where we were beginning to see a sort of a, a future while also you know we were also in in the middle of one of the worst years for Julia in terms of seizures. Wolf Hershorn children tend to start having horrible seizures when they're one year old. So we'd we'd gone through fifteen seizures and and um, several um, hospital trips because of that. So we we were certainly living through a very difficult time when we made that film, but we were in a completely different place to where we were when we first had the diagnosis. Um, so, 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 so things were very raw and I hope when people see us interviewed in the film and, and the other two families, they will see that combination of, uh, of the pain that we were still, still feeling, but also a kind of sense of defiance and hope and joy in our children, which I think, you know, defines the vast majority of parents of rare disease children who I mean, the, the thing that sort of strikes me is that there are lots of families who just don't really want to speak about this situation. And that's absolutely fine because they are doing the right thing, which is living their lives and 
trying very hard to make their lives and the lives of their children, both the rare disease children and, and their siblings, as completely normal and amazing as possible. So in a way, you know, why would they take the time to speak and dwell on yeah. these other things? And, and I'm torn in two directions. I partly feel like that and, and partly feel that I, for my own sake and for others to try and talk about some of these issues as well, particularly as a dad, because I, I, I don't hear many fathers talking about this. Um, but you also don't hear that many people, I think it's fair to say, speaking in that first um, few years where things are particularly raw. You often hear the people who are very closely involved in advocacy and, 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 and the syndrome groups, etc., with years, often decades of experience speaking. And, and they are amazing and a font of information. Um, at the same time, I personally found that a little bit intimidating early on because um, I, I probably would have been very easily led in the vulnerable situation I was in. I was trying to work it out for myself. So I sort of hope that by speaking in this film, I've sort of shown a kind of non-intimidating vulnerability that other new parents will pick up from. They'll say, oh, it's okay to feel scared like this guy clearly does um, and it's okay to feel optimistic for the future and it's okay to feel tremendous joy and pride in his child as well so it's a delicate combination I think every parent voice has a place at various stages in the journey you just kind of need to hear the right person at the right moment as you're dealing with things really yeah, I mean, I'd agree. I mean, I know from my own experience of having a child with a rare disease, when we very early on did a story um, about, you know, Isaac and his condition, it was so that a wider audience could, you know, learn about the condition and it was really important to us. And I think, you know, like you say, and it's, it's really important to keep those um, voices given an honest account and not just a carefully cra crafted, scripted, mm. you know, and, and I think that's, that's the important thing. And I think um, with organisations, when they're looking at what they want to be sharing and, and things, it's very important for them to consider the fact that they're not predefining what that speech or that, that conversation will look like. Um, I mean, this can, you know, go on, sorry. Shirley. I was just going to say, that, uh, um, there's a bit that's not in the film, and I don't know if you remember saying this, Tom, but I remember in the filming, um, you also talked really eloquently, and I think this gets to a little bit of what we're just talking about, that, you know, often these stories are seen as happening to someone else, happening out there, you know, and I've, I've encountered that even this this week in terms of, it's almost like a cult of celebrity around the patient who has a, you know, a rare disease story as if they are rare yet collectively. And as diagnoses are occur, we know that collectively they aren't rare. And there, there's a lot that you've, you've said too. Um, you, you've written about this, but you've, you said in, in um, some of the filming about how you felt about that, this, this whole um, sense that this wouldn't happen to you and I think that's quite a powerful story as well it's like how do, how do we how do we get these you know we call them rare stories but they're you know they're potentially all of us and how do we you know talk about that in terms of this is life and 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 bring that out yeah I mean, I, yeah I and mean, I can't emphasize enough I mean I'm sure this is the same for for every parent in this situation is that this shouldn't have happened to us and that now obviously seems you know laughable to be saying that but i can't stress enough you know this was not in the life plan uh there was no reason why this should have happened and for months and months and months you know we were in denial and we were mourning the loss of a child that never existed you know we we, we made some of the film in julia's bedroom at a stage where Julia, through the own force of her personality, had claimed that bedroom for herself that we had kind of lovingly decorated with a different child in mind before she was born. And it took quite a while to, to give that up. And I think that's a hugely important um, stage is actually is, is giving up on this illusion that you had before and embracing 
and what, what you have. And, you know, many families, from what I can tell, you know, that happens so naturally and so strongly um, that you get to the stage where you can't imagine any other situation. And, we, and Julia's only three. And for us now, she and our lives are normal, which a lot of families would, would find crazy. But, you know, the, the ambulance coming round, uh, you know, even us five-year-old son now deals with all of that extremely well um so i'm losing i'm losing my train of thought but um but yeah i yeah. think so, i think yeah, i i think what you know what you're saying is um so important because it is about different stages in people's journeys and that, that evolves over time and hopefully you know through the film we have captured different people's stories at different stages because obviously Maya is talking from a perspective you know of a much longer diagnostic journey and you know yourself Tom you got a diagnosis very 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 quickly and the differences that are surrounding that is hopefully you know drawn on and discussed in the film I think when we're looking at the creative aspects I think it's really important to to uh, keep that honesty, but also make something that is appealing to a wider audience. Because, yeah. you know, death and destruction is very difficult to to look at on any platform. And, you know, you want people to actually watch something or look at something and be captivated by it so that you will find out more. Um, do you think that there's a place for that in industry? Because obviously we quite often see images and stories and things coming through uh, from an industry perspective and they sometimes do seem highly glossed I mean it was really wonderful for us that you were you know on the same level as, as ourselves when it came to showing the honesty and everything so it'd be quite good to hear what you think Shirlene. Yeah, I think I think that's true I think historically you know industry um, has potentially, uh, you know, been in the, in the business of, well, it's in, in the business world, isn't it? It's in the business of marketing. And I think, you know, I think increasingly there's um, a really strong ethic coming out in industry in terms of um, being very, very concerned about patient outcomes, being very, very concerned about, um, you know the impact of what of what we do and you know for for us at Illumina it's the impact of our technology is you know we we passionately believe in the potential of this to to you know bring genomics closer to the patient but in bringing genomics closer to the patient there's a reality there and I think it's really important to not only capture that reality but then to be able to use that to start to address change and you know we we want to see a system that's supportive we want to see a system in which you know genomic diagnosis is not just a, a an end point you know it's a, so often what we have heard are the stories like Myers of these long um, diagnostic odysseys and then the end point is the diagnosis when actually what I love is that we have that story with Maya but we also you know and we have the very powerful account of um, the work that diagnosis gave her was allowing her to be a mum again and you know that is just an incredible statement to, to say that diagnosis allows you to be a mum again but also I think with Tom and Helene and also with Sarah and Jordan you see diagnosis as being a beginning and I think that's a really important story for us to tell it's n it's not just an end point it's a beginning point in terms of this journey and this is about human lives this is about families this is about well-being in society and this is about the way that our society responds and I, I think we'd be um, unethical we'd be naive in any way to ignore that you know to think that diagnosis is the end point diagnosis is clearly you know a starting point of a whole other journey and what does that journey look like and how, how you know how can we be involved in making sure that that process you know the systems you know change to respond to that thank you i mean yeah i i i think it is important and i think organizations um industry and you know patients themselves and the families 
think it is really important that our message is getting out there and that it is reaching that wider audience. I think, you know, we could talk about this for hours and hours, but unfortunately we're restricted with time. Tom, I think to finish off, perhaps I could ask you, you know, as a, as a parent and as somebody who previously hadn't shared their story and experiences with people, what made you want to share your experience and take part in the journey of hope in this, uh, in this instance? Why did you feel inspired to do that? And I think that'd be quite useful for organizations watching to see when they're trying to reach out to families. I mean, I think, I think it was very much the, the nature of what, you know, if, if, if this had been a Channel 4 News hard-hitting investigative journalism piece, you know, re requiring um, a, an angry parent, you know, a rightfully angry person wanting to talk about EHCPs or something like that at the time or deficiencies in NHS or whatever, then I, I probably wouldn't have been the right person at the right time. Uh, I, I might be becoming more that person eventually, but we'll, we'll see. Um, I was, for me, I, I felt that I needed to do this um, in a positive way. You were offering a way of telling a story in a very frank way that was going to be upsetting viewing to some extent, mm -hmm. but crucially for me, that was going to um, show Julia, Julia's life in a beautiful way, which is how, not just how we as a family see it, but crucially how it is. I'm an incredibly cynical person. I'm not remotely deluded. I think sometimes when people who are not in this situation watch parents of rare disease children beaming about how amazing their children are, I think they sometimes think that we've just gone a bit mad that life's been so hard for us that we're kidding ourselves that things are okay. And I actually think sometimes medical professionals feel like that as well sometimes. And I can tell you that is absolutely not the case. And it takes away due credit to our kids for how amazing they are. I haven't had to convince myself of anything. Julia has done that with her huge personality um, and the amazing things that she does. She's the one who dragged us out of feeling sorry for ourselves and said hey come on you're going to pull your socks up because I'm amazing and I need you to do cool stuff for me um, and you you know we we came together to make this film at that moment where that was just beginning and you know there are there are lots of times where I'm happy to complain about you know how this country doesn't look after disabled people well enough and and etc and how I want to change attitudes etc I'm angry you know, a fair few times, but I want to change attitudes by just highlighting how amazing Julia is really. And yeah. that is what you were doing in a, in really quite a unique way. And it, to be honest, it's astonishing that there's not more of what you're doing. You're not sugarcoating any of this. You're telling the, the truth, but it's okay to do that in a beautiful way, because I think if you don't, you will not bring all the other people along. And I don't really need to, I don't need to convince other parents in this situation because they already get it. Unless we change the opinions of people in the street um, and people and policymakers, et cetera, then, you know, we're just talking in an echo chamber. Um, so, so it, it was the way you were doing it that convinced me that this was the right time and the right moment. Thank you, Tom. I must admit, you know, it was an absolute pleasure. And I think, you know, hopefully it comes across in the film that it was really a joy to do. <laughs> and, um, you know, as an organisation, we're really grateful for the support for Lumina because it meant that we were able to do this. And, you know, working with Shirlene and, and certainly on the creative process, we did really explore lots of things and talk about it in great detail. I mean, you know, people make the assumption that things just happen overnight. And whilst not at all, is it? And whilst this film, you know, was relatively incredibly quick from the beginning to um, the final edit, you know, the whole thinking behind this took years because it takes so long to actually get to the point where you're ready to to create a film or to take a photograph and you know it's not just something that happens overnight and you know hopefully 
that scene, you know, in the end product. Um, I'm really grateful to you both joining me today. I know it's only been a small snapshot about, you know, the world of creativity and the patient voice. But hopefully, you know, if people want to see or learn more about the journey of hope, they can visit our website and they can see more in-depth stories about Julia, Tom, Helen, um, and, you know, learn more about the whole process. It's also available in lots of different languages now, thanks to Aluma again. So, um, you know, we really hope it does reach out to as many people as possible. I'm going to hang around now and answer any questions that you might have. But thank you so much to Tom and Shirlene for joining me. Oh, thank you, Kiri. <laughs> um, I thought it was absolutely wonderful just to get that perspective from, from Tom and Shirlene and everybody in the film. Well, thank you everybody so much for coming to this session. Thanks everybody for joining us. Take care. Thank you and thanks, Laura. Bye. Thanks, Kerry. Bye.